everyone. My name is Angie Chang, and I'm the founder of Girl Geek X. So I want to thank you so much for coming out tonight to the Microsoft Reactor. Angie spoke at my boot camp and told us all about Girl Geek Dinner, and I thought that sounds so cool. So it's literally a dream come true, and I get to be your MC. Similar to the way Girl Geek inspires and connects women in technology, our reactors are all about being community hubs and giving developers and startups the tools where they can learn, connect, and build. We have all kinds of programs and mechanisms to drive innovation. I play violin, so we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a violin that we could light up with the colors that I see in real time? This didn't exist, so of course you have to go to the drawing board. This is one of my designs among the other ones I brought. It's an accelerometer in here, so if it achieves a certain angle, it will light up like the stars. <laughs> I'll give a quick introduction on LinkedIn and some of the products that are really powered very heavily by machine learning. Just imagine if we were connected to one another, there's so much value we can bring in each other's life. It's not just about innovating. It's about innovating with purpose and really making sure that you're actually leaving the world in a better place than you found it before you introduced your solutions. We ended up deciding that this violin on its own, LEDs aside, was a really great product. So why not release it open source for people to 3D print their own music programs? Forgetting the boundaries of management, realizing that there's one goal that we have is to get an end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle ready. It was the key thing for us. This is a guide to see where you are in this chart of Ikigai and figure out what would you like to be. What would be your advice to someone who's looking to move up and have a successful career as a person in tech? Do what you're passionate about because when you're passionate, you bring your best. If you want to do something and it looks very risky, just go ahead and do it. Maximum, you're going to fail, but you'll learn something from it. Uh, I think this is amazing. Room full of women, how many times in a day do we get to see that or even a month, right? Talk to as many people as you can in this industry. So hi everyone, my name is Angie Chang and I'm the founder of Girl Geek X. So I want to thank you so much for coming out tonight to the Microsoft Reactor. I'm super excited to see everyone here and to introduce you to all of Microsoft's Girl Geeks, to see these amazing art and tech demos. Who here signed up for a demo? I saw a lot of people interested in demos and getting tours, so I'm really excited that you are able to do that. Um, thank you once again to Microsoft and to all the people who helped plan this night. Um, my, uh, so, how many of you, this is your first Girl Geek dinner? Wow. And how many of you consider yourself like a regular at Girl Geek Dinners? Thank you so much for coming back again and again. We do this almost every week, uh, going to different tech companies, meeting the Girl Geeks, and we hope you tune in to our podcast. We have a regular podcast on topics from internet security to emotional security to management to working in the Silicon Valley. So please tune in on iTunes or Spotify. We also have a very active social media. So if you follow us at Girl Geek X, you can also tweet and share about with Girl Geek X Microsoft tonight, and we will retweet and reshare. Um, and now I would like to introduce our first presenter. Her name is Caitlin Hova, and she is the co-owner of Hova Labs, where they have designed and produced the Hovalin, which is um, a 3D printed violin. Caitlin? Thank you so much for having me, this is wonderful. So my name is Caitlin Hova, I currently work at Join, and I also co-own a company called Hova Labs, where we like to make a lot, bunch of like weird projects. It's kind of like one of those like, oh, if I had time, why wouldn't I make this kind of companies? Uh, so it's just me and my husband, and the biggest thing that we really wanted to do was to find a way to convey what synesthesia was like in real time. Who here knows what synesthesia is? Yeah, it's not very many people, it's all right. So synesthesia is a neurological phenomenon in which two senses are inherently crossed, causing sensations from one sense to lead to an automatic but also involuntary experience in another. A version of this is called chromesthesia, which is when people can physically see sounds. 
Uh, I didn't know this was in any way unusual <laughs> until I was around 21 years old when I was in my final music theory course and our professor just mentioned, oh, isn't it crazy that some people can see sounds? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I ended up dropping my music degree and going into neuroscience because that's way more interesting, right? Uh, so ever since then, I've been trying to find a way to display what synesthesia was like because when you're discussing it with people, it tends to end up going into the more like psychedelic conversation and it's not really. So how to display it? I play a violin, so we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a violin that we could light up with the colors that I see in real time? Uh, this didn't exist, so of course you have to go to the drawing board. And the first thing on our list was, what if we had a clear violin and we just put LEDs in that? We couldn't find a clear violin, and if we could, it was probably too expensive. So ended up deciding, like, well, how hard would it be to like 3D print one, <laughs> right? It took a year and a half to figure out how not to make a violin and then to figure out how to. <laughs> I think we went through about like 30 or 40 iterations uh, because you end up getting really desperate and saying like, well, what is a violin anyway? <laughs> because it's really hard to make this. It started out as a stick with strings <laughs> and then kind of grew from there. So now, here it is. Once we got our first prototype, we ended up deciding that this violin on its own, LEDs aside, was a really great product. So why not release it open source for people to 3D print their own music programs? We're still seeing a trend in schools where music is systematically underfunded, while these same schools are getting STEM grants. So why not? <laughs> Seems like a connection there. Thank you. <laughs> Let's hear it for Caitlin. Caitlin, uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. This is fantastic. What a great way to start off such an inspirational evening. So oh, thank thanks. you very much. Cheers. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the San Francisco Microsoft Reactor and the Girl Geek thank Dinner. You, My name is Emily Hove. I'm part of the Global Microsoft I'm Reactor so Program. And we have a lot of synergies between Girl Geek and the Microsoft Reactors. Similar to the way Girl Geek inspires and connects women in technology, our reactors are all about being community hubs and everything that is related to developers and startups, giving developers and startups the tools where they can learn, connect, and build. And so we hope you all find a, a night that is inspiring and where you're able to connect and build today. Um, if you're interested in a little bit more about the reactor program, we've got some cards um, around the room and they talk about some of the fantastic upcoming workshops and meetups that we have. So we'd love to encourage you to check out our calendar of events and invite you all to attend. And with that, I'd like to bring up Chloe Condon, who will be our MC for the evening and help introduce some of the inspiring people and inspiring women in technology that we have for you tonight. So Chloe, Cloud Development Advocate Extraordinaire. Hello, thank you so much for coming. This is theater in the round, so I'm just gonna keep walking in a circle like I'm giving a very serious keynote um, so you all don't see my back. Um, thank you so much for coming tonight. We are so excited to have you here at The Reactor. Um, has anybody, who's first time at The Reactor, this event? Incredible, that is so exciting. I hope we see you here a lot more. Um, if you want to participate in one of the fake boyfriend workshops that I put on here, you can build a button to get you out of awkward social situations. Come see me after. Uh, we are doing those all the time here. They're so much fun. Um, also ask me about my uh, smart badge. Uh, this is a little scrolling LED badge that, that we're probably gonna do a workshop for pretty soon as well. So come see me after if you're interested at all in, in learning about those events and we'll get you, get you signed up for them. Um, I'm gonna tell a little story before I introduce our first guest. Um, I am so, so excited to be your MC tonight. I actually met Angie uh, because uh, I went to Hackbrite. Do we have any Hackbrite? or boot camp grads in the audience, no? Uh, amazing, so I'm, uh, Angie spoke at my boot camp and told us all about Girl Geek Dinner and I thought that sounds so cool. I would love to go to one someday, so it's literally a dream come true to be here with all of you today. This is my first Girl Geek Dinner ever, so, and I get to be your MC. Um, so, I'm so excited to introduce our first speaker tonight. Um, she is incredible, please, 
please show everybody how cool your dress is when you come up here, or I'll be very upset. Um, I would like to introduce Kitty, who is going to tell us all about the incredible technology and fashion that she uses to make things like the amazing dress that I'm sure she's about to tell you about. So Kitty, come on up. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much, Chloe, for introducing me. So, in fact, I'm not going to talk about my dress. That's for the demo later. Uh, I'm not going to talk about actually what's behind that, all the innovation work that we've been doing at Microsoft. So I'm the manager of The Garage at Microsoft. How many of you have heard of The Garage before? Some of you. Some of you I've met, actually. Um, so this is a program that drives innovation, drives the culture of innovation and experimentation. How do we do that? We say doers, not talkers. We, we actually get our hands dirty. We, when we think about something, we act on it. These are the cultural pillars for Microsoft. To a lot of us, when we first see them, these are just words. But how do we actually implement, implement these and achieve this? We have all kinds of programs and mechanisms to drive innovation in Microsoft. Hacking. We have global sites, we have internship programs, experimental out outlet is how we ship projects out, and we have entrepreneurs program and we do storytelling. So I'm gonna go into each of these. The hacking at Microsoft has become the culture. Uh, we actually organized the world's largest global hackathon at Microsoft, and the garage is the organization that organizes it. Guess how many people attended this year? Globally, there were 27,000 people attending our hackathon, and everyone was excitedly bringing their great ideas to the hackathon and forming teams all around the world. Uh, whether or not you know them, whether or not you're from the same uh, org, same teams, you can put your skills together and build something that you feel passionate about. We had thousands of projects every year submitted to the hackathon. And the garage helps people not only have these ideas uh, submitted, we help them grow their ideas uh, into pro uh, prototypes and we help them ship. Satya is a big supporter for our hackathon. He walks in the tent uh, and look at the projects. They, uh, he said last year, um, bigger ideas, more customers. So we can hack on anything we want. So it could be small things. Um, it could be something that we um, use every day. Um, it could be something that has real impact in the society. We can really help our customers achieve their industry scale ideas. So we also work with our customers and we bring our customers to come here to hack. The uh, experimental outlet, we also call it a ship channel. So this is a mechanism for us to get those ideas in, but also um, provide them with the business model, uh, idea building, uh, how to enter the market, and we help our employees ship those um, projects out. So if you go to the garage website, you will see about 100 projects that's already in the market, and we feature our employees who came up with those good ideas. And you can see all the teams on the website, everyone who um, put their part time together to uh, really achieve something. So we also have very big uh, projects that we collaborated with industry partners and customers. Entrepreneurs program is kind of uh, internal startup program. Um, it involves these ideas, these uh, teams, hackathon teams, to actually pitch their ideas to the leaders and get support. So some of these uh, projects can grow into a feature of an existing Microsoft product, or sometimes they um, become a product of Microsoft. We also run our internship program very differently. This, um, if you are familiar with uh, traditional internships, usually students come in and they work under one manager um, in a, a big 
team working on a small part of a big project. Instead, our interns come in as a team. And they, inside a team, uh, usually we hire like 30 uh, students per site. Silicon Valley just started our first pilot program. So we only had one team, but we had six really, really good students. Um, Usually we have teams of six to eight, and uh, they have um, developers, uh, usually a PM and a designer, forming a complete skill set. And then business teams at Microsoft pitch their ideas to our interns, and the interns pick which one they like to do, and they drive it like a startup in the company for 12 weeks. And then they can deliver the projects back to the team, or even better, we can ship it directly into the market. It's a very, very competitive and rewarding um, program. So if you're an undergrad, think about applying to that um, internship program at the garage. We also engage with storytelling. Those um, ideas, those projects got shipped out. We tell the story, we have a team, PR team, and um, you will see a lot of news articles about Microsoft uh, innovation. Pay attention next time when you read an article like that if they mention the garage. The global sites is also our feature. We have seven global uh, locations right now for the garage, um, and we're expanding. Each location has our own ecosystem. And we also, each location has our facility. Um, we have maker spaces, we have uh, technologies that we provide to our employees. They can do prototyping, they can uh, bring their ideas to share with their colleagues. Uh, we do um, startup pitching, we do uh, show and tell and workshops to educate our people and also give them a platform to achieve their collaborations. So these are the seven sites worldwide. We're in Silicon Valley, and uh, we are now called the Garage Bay Area. And as you can imagine, we have a unique ecosystem of a lot of startups, a lot of big companies, and universities. So we work with all of these uh, people in the ecosystem, and we collaborate to really build projects that can impact the world. So as I mentioned, we work with our employees and uh, engage with all of our business teams inside Microsoft, and we work with customers. We bring them to work on projects and hack with us. Here are some numbers. You can see that we have a very global and diverse team, but we actually only have 20 people worldwide. So um, the 20 people uh, drive all of those activities that, that I just mentioned. 27,000 hackers this year is a, a updated uh, number. Last year, behind that 27, that was 23,000. You can see that it's growing every year. It's gonna, only going to get bigger. 76 countries participate, and uh, we've held uh, more than 100 interns already, uh, all with the most competitive schools around our local areas. You can find more than 100 projects that's in the, in the uh, market and on the global website. 19 of them became actual Microsoft products and lots of social media posts, lots of uh, news articles about Microsoft innovation. So make sure you follow us on the social media. Some of the Bay Area specific projects, uh, seeing AI, uh, we build a lot of projects that help the um, people uh, with needs, people um, who have disabilities. Uh, Seeing AI is a project that we shipped a few years ago that help blind people see through technology. So you can hold uh, a phone, the camera would detect what's in front of you and also read it out, um, interpret. It can also detect facial uh, expressions and people's age. So it gives uh, blind people um, information about their surroundings. Uh, Sketch 360 is a project we just shipped last year. It's um, by an artist inside Microsoft, uh, Michael Schroeder. He had an idea of why don't we sketch uh, three, 60 pictures directly. So we can build like a full uh, environmental canvas and you can draw anything you want. You can also put that into VR or AR to visualize it. We also last year shipped the 
uh, some apps uh, span is by a my IQ team. So lots of local um, projects were just going through our uh, hackathon projects this year. So personally, that's why I'm also here to do a demo. I've built some of the projects in the garage uh, to satisfy personal ambitions. Uh, anyone in Microsoft can use the garage can, as a resource to build their communities, can build their, their projects. So I have built a lot of wearable technologies. I'm doing a demo right there. Um, we um, have these... Um, different dresses with different sensors and AI uh, machine learning functionality um, and robotic dresses that I, I can show you later on. But I also have a passion for quantum computing because of my physics background. I'm a physicist actually. So I see the need to build a community of um, people learning about quantum. So this is a study group that um, I founded in Bay Area teaching people how quantum computing works, including physics, math, the hardware, and software. And any employee with good ideas, they can do this. So we have a lot of employees who wanted to do, um, say, uh, art tech community. They can come to the garage and do that. Or they have passion for IoT, they can come to the garage and do that. So these are just some examples. So since uh, Girls Geek is uh, also sort of about Korea, I think this would be my last slide to show you um, something about your aspiration. This is a guide to see where you are in this chart of Ikigai and see where you are and figure out what would you like to be. Um, I think for me, I can feel Ikigai at Microsoft because I'm doing something I love, uh, something the world needs, and something I can be paid for that's, that's important and something I'm good at. So if you can get to that sweet spot, that should be your goal. And also, think about how you align to the global goals. That's um, what I can do. I highlighted some of the, uh, the goals that I could do in the company as well as uh, through my personal projects. I think I would love to expand this, and I think this will be a good guide for everyone how uh, we can do more impactful world, uh, work for the world. Thank you. Okay, wait, you cannot leave the stage without sharing this dress. <laughs> I'm gonna make you model it, it is so incredible. <laughs> so do you wanna say a little bit about it first? Okay, this is one of my designs among the other ones I brought. Um, uh, all of these prints are my own paintings. This is a painting of Saturn. And I wanted to simulate Saturn on the dress. How do I do that? Uh, because Saturn has a ring. So why don't I make a ring that when I rotate, it will show Saturn. It also has a, a angle detector. It's an accelerometer in here. So if it achieves a certain angle, it will light up like the <laughs> The stars. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. You have to. When you wear such a fabulous dress, we should have had a catwalk. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, Amazing. Thank you so much, Kitty. I really, really love that. And I loved that final slide. I, I took pictures of it so I can look at it later and, and map out my own, my own plan. Um, I am so excited to introduce our next guest that is going to tell us all about machine learning. Priyanka, come on up to the stage. I have a little, do you need a clicker? Amazing. Here you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, first off, I'm not showing off anything as cool as what the other women did. Uh, but uh, I also want to say this is my first time here at Girl Geek Dinner, and uh, I think this is amazing. Like, look at the energy, like room full of women. How many times in a day do we get to see that, or even a month, right? Um, so thank you for having me. My name is Priyanka Gariba, and I lead uh, Artificial Intelligence Technical Program Management Group at LinkedIn. 
my talk for today is going to be um, how we are scaling machine learning at LinkedIn. We are one of the um, uh, large and complex program um, that has been funded by our engineering group. So I've structured my talk into four different areas. Um, I will talk about, I'll give a quick introduction on LinkedIn and some of the products that are really powered very heavily by machine learning. Uh, I will then get into the problem statement of the, um, what we are trying to do in order to scale machine learning. Um, then talk a little bit about our technology and then wrap it up with, uh, sure we can scale with uh, building a solution and with technology, but there's also an aspect of people. And so how do we scale that and what is LinkedIn doing about it? Okay, all right. Um, with that, let's get started with uh, the vision and mission for LinkedIn. Our vision is to create economic opportunity for every single member in the global workforce. And uh, our mission is, uh, the way we are gonna realize it is of course by connecting um, world's professional to make them more productive. Um, let's take an example of this room itself, right? So many cool things that were shown up, uh, so many cool people, so many cool women that we spoke to. Uh, just imagine if we were connected to one another, there's so much value we can bring in each other's life. Um, um, and, and LinkedIn can help us do that. So how are we trying to realize our vision and our mission is through some of our products. Um, I, I'm hoping and I think everyone here is at least having a profile on LinkedIn. And if you're not connected to um, the, the cool women here in the room, I encourage that before you leave, definitely connect with one another. Uh, but some of the pro products that really help us do that is uh, people you may know. This is a product line that really helps us build our connections. Um, it, it understands there is a recommendation system that runs behind it. There's machine learning models that run behind it, very heavily AI powered. And it really allows us to know who are the people, like-minded people that we need to be connected to and the value we can bring in each other's life by just having that connection. Then, of course, there is feed. Everybody who goes on LinkedIn as a platform is going to see feed as the first product. Um, jobs is another product which is very heavily powered by machine learning behind it. Um, and why am I talking about all these products, right? Uh, AI at LinkedIn is like oxygen. And one thing that all these products have in common is AI. And with that, what that means is we know that machine learning is everywhere. It's, it's powering every single product line that we build. It's, bringing, it's helping us bring the best experiences to all our members across the board. And so with uh, because of that one reason, we know that what we need to do is we need to enable more people to do machine learning at LinkedIn. So there are two pieces to my talk. One, which I think I'll dive into uh, more than the, the second one, is going to be technology. There is one way we can scale technology is by building a solution. How do we enable our machine learning engineers to really build and deploy models faster so that the experiences that they can bring to all the members is, is at a faster rate? Um, and the second one is scaling by scaling people. Um, so to tap into the exact problem that we are trying to solve, uh, let's look at a machine learning development life cycle. It, it's as simple as any, any software development life cycle, right? Basically, a machine learning engineer has an idea. There's something you want to solve for. What are the first couple of things that they would do? They'll think about what are the machine learning features that are available to them? How do you crank up all these features together, try and test it on a, in an offline model, train, the, train with some data sets? And once you evaluate and feel comfortable that this is something good, the next big piece is going to be actually serving it in production and then giving uh, seeing the seeing results through A-B testing and all of that. Um, not going to dive too much into this. This really just is um, an extension of that life cycle. Basically, you start with an idea, and then there are different functions along the way. There is a product management. There is dev. Um, and, and the way we really make decisions on product is very heavily powered by our A-B uh, testing platform. Um, we make RAM decisions only based on that. Once we see the results, only then do we agree, do we believe that that is a model that we want to RAM further to our exp uh, to our uh, members. Um, why talk about all of this? Why talk about the life cycle, right? Uh, if, if all these products are being built at LinkedIn and if so many people are doing it and all the teams are doing this, 
what that means is every single team is doing and deploying models in a very different way. There are many, many technologies. There are, they are all on different stacks. They, it's not standardized across the board. And uh, one thing we allow, I mean, we encourage at LinkedIn is for people to move around within teams. And so today, if you want to work on a feed team, tomorrow you want to work on a gym beat, uh, job recommendation team, how do you do that? Your stack is different. Half the days are going to be spent in just ramping up. So we introduce something called as productive machine learning. Really, our goal is to enable end-to-end -end, um, uh, end -end experience of a machine development life cycle to be more robust, reliable, and consistent, and standardized. What the experience we are looking for is for an ML engineer, all you have to worry about is come up with an idea, and then there is everything else is opaque for you. There is a big box, and you don't have to worry on how you move from one phase to the other. Ideation, to feed machine learning features, to training, to scoring, to, to serving it in, the, in production. You don't have to worry about this. And how are we going to do that? So we've put together this program. It's to give you context, this is a really um, large scale program, about 60 to 100 engineers across the board working on it, um, different geolocations. And the way we are structuring it is by talking about three different phases, uh, model creation, going back to that life cycle that you saw, everything from ideation to training and uh, evaluating your model comes under model creation. And so we have multiple components that blend into that. Then the next piece for us is deployment. Once you believe that your model is really good and ready for serving, you deploy it in production. And the third piece, this is not really a phase, but something that got cuts across is um, making sure your quality is accurate, meaning features that you used for your offline training are very similar to what you see in online. So online, offline consistency. Um, uh, so I, I just wanted to, because I had 10 minutes, I just wanted to give you a flavor of this big undertaking that we are doing at LinkedIn and um, uh, also give you a little bit of flavor of how we are structured. Um, typically, every time we build something, you know, we, ha we follow a traditional model, you have a leader, you have multiple managers, you have engineers, and you know, you come up for a, uh, you come up with a goal on a project and everyone works together. This one, we wanted to do something different. What we did is, Let's bring every single person in LinkedIn who is really passionate about solving this problem. So put together a virtual team. We had everyone across the board in different geolocations tubes. There is someone who will be infrastructure heavy. There is someone who is a machine learning engineer who can help us really uh, give us inputs when we are building the solution that it's really going to work for them. And then there's product managers, CPMs, engineers across the board. But it's really... All of these coming together, forgetting the boundaries of management, realizing that there's one goal that we have is to get an end-to-end -end machine learning lifecycle ready um, was the key thing for us. And I already mentioned that team of teams were, were, geolo uh, were geolocated. And that is also um, one reason why we wanted to do that is we wanted engineers across the board. Because if we were solving a problem just for headquarters, which is a, which is a mountain view, uh, you know, it, we, we would not be solving for everyone at LinkedIn. Um, and then, of course, with any product that you build in any company, right, there is a big piece of adoption. So for us, the strategy that we have used is that let's, the three big phases that we spoke about, let's build small components underneath it, and let's allow every product team to pick up um, pick, up a, uh, pick up a component and adopt that uh, depending on what their pain point is. So for example, if a feed team is really struggling with how do you train a model, then what we wanted to offer them is pick up that component and get adopted on that. And once you buy the idea, then you know uh, slowly and gradually navigate into the uh, adoption of the other components too. This helped both ways. This helped us get real early feedback from our uh, customers and users. And then it also allowed us to like load balance. So we could develop things while something was already being tested and we were getting that iteration loop from our users. Um, so I spoke about the technology. I spoke about the solution. The second thing that LinkedIn is doing, and I'm just giving a very high level preview of this, is um, in order for us to democratize AI or to make it readily available and to enable more engineers to do that, uh, there's a program that LinkedIn's kicked off. It's called AI Academy. There are three different types of coursework of program, AI 100, 200, 300. Um, as you graduate from one to the other, really the intensity of uh, uh, 
the techniques in machine learning um, in increases. So AI 100 is really just getting a flavor of what AI is, what machine learning is, and get you familiar, uh, familiarized with it. And then 200, you start understanding how do you build a model. And three is when you actually build your own model and like uh, put it in production. Uh, I can talk all about this, and I'm happy to talk about it later on, but this is just a preview, and there's a lot of blogs and things that we've already put on LinkedIn. Um, this is another blog for productive machine learning for those of who, uh, you who are interested in uh, reading more about it, and I'll share my slides as well. Um, and uh, that's it. Uh, just, just a quick flavor. I had 10 minutes, so I thought at least I'll come up here and talk to you and give you a flavor of what we are doing uh, to democratize uh, uh, machine learning at LinkedIn. But happy to, I don't know if I have time for questions, but I can talk, uh, I can take questions later on as well. Thank you. Um, okay, I can take a question or two if after. Okay, all right, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, so next up, I will take that from you. Next up, we have a very special treat, but before I introduce our very special guest, I'm going to show you my favorite LinkedIn feature. How many people have added someone on LinkedIn tonight? Okay, well, now you're going to add more people. So um, if you go to your LinkedIn app, in the very top in the search bar, there's a barcode, a scanning barcode. And if you click on that, instead of having to type out the person's name and awkwardly ask for spelling, you can just scan their barcode tonight. So you can uh, share that s secret tip that I learned recently from someone else at a meetup that I now pass on to you to make spelling people's names less awkward. Um, so definitely scan everyone's badge here tonight. Uh, my best advice always in tech is to meet as many people as you can and um, tell your story and share their stories while you're here tonight with all these amazing people. Um, I am going to welcome our very, very special guest for tonight, Charlotte. Come on down. We are so excited to welcome Charlotte Yarconi to the SF Reactor. Here you go. Thank you. I, I need to start out and tell you guys I'm sick. I really, really apologize for my voice. I've been told I don't look as bad as I sound, so I thought it'd still be okay to show up. But hopefully you'll manage to, to go with me this evening. It was important for me to come. So again, I hope you can work with me on the, on the sound quality. But my problem is, as I'm watching everybody on stage, I, I wanted one of these mics so I could put it down, cough, and anywhere I'm, I go, I'm gonna, somebody's in my blast radius. So if I come over here and stand by the post, please don't, please don't be offended. Um, anyways, good to be here tonight. Thank you guys all for coming. I thought what I would do is first share with you a little bit about my journey of, of being a woman in tech and what that's meant to me in my career. I do need a clicker. Aha! My telepathic PowerPoint clicking slides are not on today due to the head cold. So, you know, I, I actually go talk a lot to universities, I go to some high schools. I love talking to young girls about STEM, but I always kind of have to ground in, let me tell you what tech looked like when I was in middle school and high school. This was it, by the way. There were no smartphones, there were no tablets, there were no laptops. Uh, I remember when asteroids came out and me and my brothers thought it was amazing, right? So that's kind of where we were. And then, this was our social network. There was no Twitter, there was no WeChat, there was no Snapchat. It was pretty much a bonfire in somebody's field when their parents were out of town, in the town I grew up in. So that's kind of where I come from. And I actually, I grew up in South Carolina. I was super fortunate to get a scholarship to come to UC Berkeley. I'm pretty sure I'm the only person from South Carolina to ever go to Berkeley. Um, <laughs> And I was actually part of, of an inaugural program at the time called Electrical Engineering or Computer Science, or EECS, as it was known. And this is what code looked like when I was coding. Has anybody ever written in Lisp? Anyone? Did anyone? Yeah. <laughs> Kicking it old school. All right. So that was sort of my education, if you will, and my real foray into tech. 
And then I got out of college and started working and figuring out how to use technology as an applied science, not just in an academic sense. And this was kind of the world I was in, right? Actually, cell phones came out, and yes, that's what they look like for those of you that weren't born then, because I know there's a few of you here. Windows 95 was all the rage, right? You remember that? But then we get to today, and it's just a very, very different world, right? And one of the things that I love about technology is the fact that it has actually opened up all of our worlds in so many ways that we can have so much more impact. You know, we can instantly connect to people that we could never connect to 30, 40, 50 years ago. I'm not that old. I'm just framing my comments. <laughs> but you think about that. And it's not just connecting to those people, it's the access to information that you also have immediately at your fingertips. It's amazing. It's amazing that what you can harness with that kind of resources at your fingertips. The challenge is, though, it comes with a responsibility, right? And I will tell you, at Microsoft and GitHub and LinkedIn, we spend a lot of time on that. In fact, it's not just about innovating. It's about innovating with purpose and really making sure that you're actually leaving the world in a better place than you found it before you introduced your solutions. And so it's those unintended consequences that you have to be very thoughtful about as we continue to get more and more technology at our disposal. How do we use it for good? And that kind of brings me to really what's my role. Today, my role is at Microsoft. I run a group called Commerce and Ecosystems. You can tell I'm not a marketing person, so there you go. But I'm really here, I, I focus on answering three questions. The first is, how do people actually discover who we are and what we do in our products and services? And Microsoft's a very big company. It's a global landscape. We offer lots of different products and services across our portfolio. But there are a lot of ecosystems and communities that actually don't know who we are and what we do. Five years ago, it was a lot about open source. And I remember I actually went to, I started at Microsoft about three years ago and I went to an open source conference. By the way, I grew up in open source. So my background actually started out in Unix and moved to Linux. I never wrote a piece of code in .NET. It would probably look and feel a little bit like Lisp to me, honestly, if I tried to do it now. And so when I came to Microsoft, I went to a familiar conference, and people were like, why are you here, man? Azure doesn't run Linux. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it does. People didn't know, right? So we had to go fix that. Second thing I focus on is after you discover us, how do, how do, how do you engage with us in a way that's meaningful to you? And most of that is online. People don't always want to have to go somewhere to learn how to do something. They want to have to sign up for a week-long course, right? Necessarily to know how to, how to build a solution using the technology that they have. So we spend a lot of time and energy focused on that and what's the set of tooling and resources that we can offer. And then the final point is, how do we just get easier to do business with our customers and partners? That's where the commerce piece comes in and it's all about what are some of the new business models we need to create to actually, how do we run all those capabilities across all our products and all our channels today? So there is a good bit of engineering that comes in each one of these aspects, but there's also a lot of business work that I have to focus on. And again, it comes with that overarching layer and responsibility as to how do we think about continuing to make progress in a positive way so we can have a positive impact on the communities we serve. So that's kind of who I am. And I think what we were gonna do at this stage is a little bit of like an AMA. And I'm really hoping you guys don't ask me too many questions because the more I talk, I think the worse I sound. <laughs> but I will try to answer everything for sure. But I was gonna have Chloe join me and I was gonna have Shalu Gart join me. So just as a reminder, both Chloe and Shalou are part of my team and they're part of the, the drive discovery effort. And so I'll let you guys, you guys will talk a little bit more about yourselves, I'm sure. But I'm gonna turn it over to our master of ceremonies, kick us off. Do you want that mic or you want? Oh, I, I sure. This one may be contaminated. All right. <laughs> I wouldn't want to, to catch the virus, the Charlotte virus. Amazing. So I figure we'll have a seat, uh, have a seat wherever. We 
had a bunch of people submit questions earlier in our fishbowl. Thank you so much for all of the questions that we got earlier. So what I figured I would do is we would start with an introduction with Shalou. Would you like to tell everyone yeah, who you absolutely. are, what you do? Absolutely. Firstly, thank you guys so much for, for coming here today. It means a lot. Uh, my name is Shalou Garg, and I lead the startup business growth for Silicon Valley for Microsoft. Um, and entire California as well. It's an exciting space to be in. I'm part of Charlotte's team, and part of what we do is not only engage with founders and CTOs and CIOs here of startups, but also drive meaningful partnerships, which is, you know, this is Silicon Valley. There are a lot of partners here. How do we work with them to uh, drive awareness of how Microsoft can help entrepreneurs there? So good to be here. Amazing. Thank you so much. Uh, I have these randomly selected questions here. Those are a lot of questions. It's a lot of questions. <laughs> I don't know if we're going to get through all of them. We may do kind of a rapid inside the actor's studio type uh, lightning round at the end here. But I love this first one. I chose this one first, uh, and this is for Charlotte. It says, what's it like being an executive at one of the top companies? Do you have a life? <laughs> Great phrasing, whoever wrote this. <laughs> uh, I'd like to think I have a life. <laughs> um, yes, I do have a life. I have two children, both girls. Uh, Yay! Are they coding already? <laughs> one is 23, has graduated. She went to Reed College. And by the way, um, back to, to Berkeley, I thought when I went to Berkeley from South Carolina, I was an enlightened liberal. And when I dropped my daughter off at Reed College, I felt like... <laughs> I was the most conservative person on the planet. <laughs> I was a little worried about my, my life choices at that point. Um, but she graduated there in linguistics, and she actually is uh, starting school this week, getting her master's at University of Washington. Awesome. And um, she would be very offended if I called her a developer or an engineer. Yet she spends a lot of time writing programs in R, doing statistical analysis on languages, because she focuses on Russian, Japanese, Spanish, um, language and language heritage. Wow. So that's my oldest. My youngest is 13 and um, a prolific gamer and developer. Python is her language of choice. She has lots of opinions about every other language. As she should. And it kind of takes me longer these days to set up an environment for her to code in than it does for her to whip out a new game that she's thinking about. So I'm, I'm pretty sure she's going to end up somewhere in the engineer community as a professional at one point. I also have three horses um, I ride. I grew up three-day eventing, for those of you who know what that is. It, now that I'm older and have kids, I wondered what my parents were thinking when they let me do that. Um, but I still ride, and I still compete. And, uh, and then I do my day job. I that think is a fun fact. I think the thing about today's technology is, um, you know, the, the good and the bad is it allows you to be accessible all the time. And so you can actually, you know, you have to know how to be at the right place at the right time, which is usually the conflict that occurs. But you do, you are able to go do what you need to do personally and do things professionally uh, as you go. And so that's, that's something I'm really, um, I feel privileged by who I work for in the industry I'm in and, and the technologies that we bring for all the working moms out there. Yeah, that's actually a great segue into the next question, which I'll direct to Shalou first, which is how do you relax and unwind? Like with how long and tough your day jobs are, how do you yeah, get to chill? So best is tennis. Mm -hmm. I love playing tennis and that's how I unwind. And I, when I go out and play tennis, I try not to take my cell phone with me or my kids. So I have a 13-year-old daughter, too, and a 9-year-old son, who quite a handful. Um, do you have any Serena moments on the court? I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but that's how I unwind, which is just completely unplug, you know, yeah. just, um, just a moment of zen and just, just go out there and hit it. Yeah. I'm very similar. I craft. I like to do, like, things with my hands and not look at a screen and just build something fun, like a costume or something that lights up. Yeah, and you're riding horses. <laughs> yeah, but I could, not, I could not build a costume. So, well, see, we'll we do, each have our strengths. Hit me up for Halloween. We'll get you I'm going to hit you up for Halloween. <laughs> okay. um, this one says, what would be your advice for your past self coming straight out of college? I love that question. 
Who are you asking? Anyone can jump in. Yeah. Um, I think coming out of college, I wish I was more uh, aware of getting a coach or a mentor, which I was not aware. And during my career, I sort of looked upon women leaders and requested them to be mentors and coaches. So what I try to do now is go out and coach and mentor women or young girls myself. And so I realize that they may not be in the they may be in the same situation as I was in, which is, hey, I can ask a woman leader to say, would you mind spending 30 minutes with me? But they don't ask, right? And so I preemptively do that in schools, colleges, here in Silicon Valley, actually, uh, right up our Market Street office. That's an, another office of ours. Every month, I host open, open office hours for young women who are out there, budding entrepreneurs. It doesn't have to do anything with Microsoft. So as soon as you walk in the door, it doesn't have to be, hey, you have to sign up to work with us. But it's just coaching. And um, I love it. And so I wish I had that. But a part of me is just giving back, just, just making sure that you know someone out there is benefiting. Yeah, that's great advice. Charlotte? I think um, for me, one of the things that it's taken me a long time to appreciate, and I, I really, I encourage everybody um, to, to have some thought about this for their own journey, both personally and professionally. Resilience is such an important thing. And when I look back on my career, um, you know, I'm, I feel, again, very privileged to work in all the places and spaces that I have. But, you know, the successes I had weren't one success right after the other. It was a success built off of, quite frankly, a mountain of failures and trials to get there. And, and it was about taking those learnings and applying and getting better. And I think a lot of what we do as an industry is about um, solving a problem, you know, solving an opportunity, and getting better as we go and iterating. And it's really hard to do that as a person. I'm gonna go out on a limb and assume all you people here are somewhat overachievers. And so every time that you have a failure, you know, you wanna prosecute the failure and you wanna prosecute yourself. And that's, that's okay as long as you make it a constructive thing and learn from it. And the older you get and the more experience you get, the more you start to really embrace and almost be proud of those failures for what they taught you. Because you wouldn't be wherever you are without, them. that's just a fact. And I don't know that I, I appreciated that in my younger age. Um, I was certainly an overachiever and, and you know, thought I knew a lot more than I knew at the time. I know that's shocking, but it's true. <laughs> yeah. But as I, as I went through my career, you know, it was a process for me to understand how to really get value in the mistakes, how to really get value in the failures and use them to move forward. And I just would encourage everybody, get, get out there and try, right? That's step one. And step two is make sure you learn and embrace the mistakes, right? And it is about that resilience that will just make you so much of a better person whatever you decide to do, however you decide to do it. Uh, yeah. My advice would be, I, I don't think I knew right when I graduated what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. I wish I had taken a little time to travel or maybe to explore different industries and fields that maybe I wanted to dip my toe in because I think what the wonderful thing about working in tech is you don't have to commit to doing the same thing for your entire life. You can always change and learn a completely new technology or, or there was a tweet that I think I retweeted this morning which was um, your job that you have in five years may not even exist so try not to plan out your life too strategically and I think that's really wonderful advice because technology is growing at a rapid rate and we may be working for something we don't even know exists yet. The new, I don't know, new iPhone, who knows. Um, great, next question that I have is Ooh, I love this one. What's the best book you've read this year? Does anyone have one? I know mine. I can go first while people think. <laughs> go, go for it. Um, I read a book. Oh, no. You go first because I'm gonna, I want to make sure I get her name right. <laughs> the author's name right. Um, so I think the, the life-changing moment for me was the book that I read by Eckhart Tool. It's called The Power of Now. 
Um, and it teaches you a lot about what Charlotte talked about, failure. It also teaches you how to stay engaged but not attached, right? Which is you you're really passionate about something that you're doing. Keep that passion, uh, but don't get so emotionally sucked into it that you break down, right? So it also teaches you mindfulness and awareness and then how to be an A player, right? Which is you're mindful, you're aware of what you're doing, but guess what, you gotta go and get it. And so I thought that was completely life-changing for me because I learned quite a bit um, in terms of just being strong, being very passionate about what I do, but not emotional, and then just chasing it, chasing the ball and just chasing the heck out of it. I um, Mine's an oldie but a goodie because my youngest was is doing a book report on this one. Um, the Life of Pi. Well, that's a good oh, one. I just love that. I haven't read it in many years, and so she brought it home, and I brought out my copy so we could read it together. Yeah. And it's, it is just an amazing book. I, that is on my list. You said yours was The Power of Now? Power of Now. Okay, yeah. write that one down, everyone. Um, <laughs> I recently read Just the Funny Parts by Nell Scovel. She's a female comedy writer. And I found it's an autobiographical piece she used to write for Saturday Night Live, David Letterman, and it's a completely male-dominated field. And it was the first time I had read about an industry other than tech that was similarly structured and formatted. And it talked about she's a comedy writer, so it comes from this place of empathy and humor. And I would highly, highly recommend and it, she helped write Sheryl Sandberg's book. So she, uh, she also wrote a lot of Obama's jokes I found out in that book. So <laughs> a lot of the things that made us chuckle from Obama came from her. Um, so next one is, who has influenced you most in your life and why? Uh, that, one's, that one's actually really hard. Yeah. Um, I will tell you both my parents passed away in the last year. And um, they were quite older. I'm the youngest of a large family. Pretty sure I was an accident, so it, it's okay. <laughs> but, you know, it, you, you spend a lot of time reflecting on your, your nuclear family when, when those kinds of things happen, and they happen inevitably to everyone. Um, and so I definitely think my parents had a large influence on my life. I think my teachers had a large influence on my life. I am I'm the proud product of the public education system of South Carolina, um, which I think at the time I was growing up was like 49th in the, in the country. But I went from there to UC Berkeley, which was an amazing school, right? And um, I, I had some amazing teachers to, to help me learn how to learn is, is what I got from that. I've been super fortunate to have um, some great, mentors and what I would call guidance counselors throughout my career that that I still do lunch with and dinners with and catch up with. Um, so I, I, I feel like I've had a lot of influences and I do think for the last 20 plus years though my kids have probably taught me more humility and patience and resilience and all the other virtues we speak so highly of. Um, you know, they, they've probably been the biggest forcing function in my life in recent years. What about the horses? Any influence? The horses are my <laughs> um, sanity. Yes. I will tell you, I, I, we moved to Australia for a couple of years and I couldn't take my horses with me. And I was, my husband will tell you, I was a miserable person um, <laughs> for the time I was, I was gone. I'm picturing you writing postcards back to your horses at home. <laughs> I came home. I came home every two months to see them. Aw. What about you, Shalou? So, um... Parents, but I think my mom, so I lost my parents at a very young age. Um, and I remember when thinking back growing, growing up, so I was born in India, but I grew up in the Middle East. And I grew up in a community where, you know, there was a lot of domestic violence and girls were not allowed to go to school. And so there were a lot of changes that, I ha that were happening around me. In fact, while growing up, I, had, I went to 14 different schools. Uh, between elementary, middle, and high school. So you can imagine, you know, moving from Saudi Arabia to Iraq to Kuwait during the war zone time. But I remember um, going through all this, my mom always taught me and my sister is that if there's ever a problem in life and there is a simpler solution and there is a hard solution, guess what? Pick the hardest one. 
because it's going to make you go through that process, whereas a simpler one, you're just going to take it and just sit with it, and you're not going to learn anything. So I, I do look back, and I think that she's had an amazing influence on me. And as Charlotte said, my kids, I keep learning from them every single day. You know, they teach me so many things in terms of, you know, if I get upset about something, they'll just say, hey, mom, just relax. It's, you know, this is just a small thing. Just move on. Um, and I think that's how I keep learning more and more. And of course, amazing coaches and mentors and um, some really amazing female leaders who I look upon to. Yeah. Um, I would have to agree. Uh, my, my mother passed away when I was 16, but she was a costume designer, graphic designer, creative arts person. And I try to bring my creative arts training and background into all the technology that I do and create. So um, I, I think that was probably the biggest influence on me would have to be my, my mom as well. Um, what is the biggest challenge we are facing in tech currently? A tough one. I, I actually think our biggest challenge as a society is climate change. And I think technology can be a solution for that. So that's an indirect question, answer to a direct question. But I would say that is the thing that, that I would love to see all of us. I don't care what you're doing, where you're working, but to, to start having serious thoughts about how we can go reverse decades of, of adverse effect on the planet, it, it helps everybody. And I do think that the real accelerants are gonna lie, not just in changing our behavior and our consumption, but also in having technology help us. And I don't think we've really um, gone there yet as a society at large. So. For me, it's, it's something I'm kind of anxious to push along however I can in whatever small way that I can. Um, I think that's, that's how I think about it. You know, with technology, you have things like quantum, which is just amazing. And, you know, the beauty of working somewhere like Microsoft is we are spending a ton of research and we have really crazy people, crazy smart people working on this. And every now and then, if I have to go give a talk and, you know, I need to give my five minutes of quantum uh, computing update for the cloud, I always ask, are there any theoretical, you know, physicists in the audience? Because if there are, I'm not going to do this because you know way more than me <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> um, but it's amazing. And in essence, you take what sits in a data center the size of a football field today and you can run it in what's in the size of a refrigerator in your house. But... The cooling you need to do that is, is extraordinarily more than the power we're consuming today and the impact that will have, by the way, if it's not done right, either we're not producing it correctly and or we're not cooling it correctly, can have a devastating effect, right? So how do we think about things like that, these new trends with this aspect of sustainability around the climate, I think is super important. So I apologize. I kind of rambled on that uh, answer, but I actually think this one's a really important one. I agree. I actually met someone uh, at Open Source Summit recently who works on our IoT team here at Microsoft in Redmond. Um, and his job on the IoT team is to help offset our carbon emissions from our server center. So like, I thought, oh, that's such an important, important way for us to help make the environment a better place with Microsoft. So yeah. What? Absolutely. And you know, the lady who runs our, our data centers. Um, her name's Noelle. She's a peer of mine. I, I love her dearly. She's just an amazing woman. She actually grew up as a chemical engineer. Wow. And a lot of her time on how do we run our data centers is spent in areas that, you know, you and I know, wouldn't know how to go solve because it is about how do you think about power? How do you think about new sources like geothermal and things like that? And I think it's great. I think it's great we're thinking that way, but we got to do more of it. Yes. Yeah. You know, I think the biggest challenge is the power, the knowledge or the lack of awareness behind power of technology, right? So 
I often see this, I keep bringing up EdTech as a very common example, and in fact, here in the Valley, EdTech is right now the hottest topic in the social impact circle, right? When we, I can, I can guarantee you, when I throw the word school out here and I ask you, just close your eyes and think of, tell me what you think of. You're gonna think of a building, you're gonna think of kids running, a blackboard and a teacher, but that's not what education is only. I mean, education can be a seven-year-old girl sitting in Uganda who's not allowed to go to school, but she can sit at home and do um, schooling at home using an iPad, right? Just because she's a girl, she's not allowed to go to school. That is the power of technology, and it kills me every single day when I read about you know, places like Somalia and Syria and so many other places where easily companies, and Microsoft does an amazing job. That's one thing I'm really proud to be, which is be part of this company. We do amazing work globally in enabling this. And I think we need to continue to talk about the power of technology, which we, we do in our jobs and outside our jobs, but we need more and more people to go out there and coach people and say, hey guys, education is just not about textbooks. It can be digital education powered by technology. And I think that to me is, is the biggest challenge right now, which is lack of awareness. Yeah, accessibility and access yep. to that is so important. Can, can I interrupt this broadcast? Do we have any recruiters in the audience? Because I think we have our, our newest oh. recruit. <laughs> She's doing awesome walking, by the way. Love the pants. Gray pants. <laughs> this is a very fun question. What emoji do you use most often? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> you know, I don't use them correctly. Okay. As okay. my children. I always send them it's stuff. It's the and they're like, one, right? Why did you send me this? Do you know what this means? And I'm like, no. I... I, I no. I think I that's part of your job as a mom, right? <laughs> so I have gotten in this habit of sending random ones just to freak my kids out. Love it. Um, I usually am pretty clean at work with the okay and the goofball face and the <laughs> smiley face. But um, it, it, it cracks me up because we were just having this discussion the other day because I, I sent something that apparently I shouldn't have sent as a parent. <laughs> it's a lot but, of secret hidden emoji language. It I really like. is. Yeah. And you, what do you use? I would say it's a tie between the sobbing emoji and the laugh crying emoji because I don't have any other two emotions other than those two extremes. <laughs> There's no in-between for me. I'm either hysterically laughing or hysterically crying. <laughs> what do you use, Shula? Uh Smile. <laughs> and uh, laughter. Yes. Yeah. And that's it. And I, for the kids, with the kids, I'll just use hearts. And sometimes my daughter says, Mom, just stop using those big <laughs> <laughs> You're embarrassing me, Mom. Yeah. What are, uh, what are the most important... What are the most important decisions you face every day? Or what is the most important decision you face every day? Um, how to make founders successful. And especially in a market like this, um, I just love it. It's, it's an upstream market, constantly challenging ourselves, you know. What else can we do? What else can we do in this market? And I absolutely love it. It is challenging. It's extremely challenging. It's a huge question. It's, it's a huge question. I've been with the company for eight months. And when I joined initially, I was a bit nervous. I was like, great, I'm so excited about this job. And when I went out there, talked to founders, everyone was like, everyone gave me a standard response. Well, yeah, OK. But now, slowly and slowly, you know, we've started building it as part of the narrative that we have internally, the meetings, which is, how do we help the founders? And if we switch that, our jobs become much more easier, which is, I'm here to help you, and this is how I can help you. So I think that, to me, is, is absolutely the most fun part. Yeah. I, I, by the way, it's part of my team. That's a great answer for this little <laughs> startups. I, I think my job is, is really making the set of decisions that, that best serve our customers, our partners, best serve the team. Um, you know, the, it's, it's always a balance, right? We have so much we've got to get done. We, we love innovating. We love getting new capabilities out there, making sure that we're doing that with the right sense of urgency and the right balance for the teams delivering them. Um, is, is most of my day in, in any one of my teams that I look at. 
is just making the right calls to make sure that we're doing right by the community is both our community that's working on it and the communities we're trying to we're trying to serve so I would say for me, it's how to get people excited to learn and what is going to get them having fun. Because I think we we work all day. We work like an eight hour plus day sometimes um, in front of machines using technology. And what are fun, creative ways to get people excited about that and to build really cool, amazing things together that can solve these these big questions and problems like the environment and getting accessibility to folks who don't have access to this technology. So it's always fun to enable that, that power to people. Um, how much time do we have? Do we want to do maybe one or two more questions? One more question? Okay, cool. Um, let's see. This is, a, this is, I think this is a really good, actually, I would love to end with your advice to all of our amazing women in this audience and men in the audience. Um, what would be your advice to someone who's looking to move up in their career and have a successful career as, as a person in tech? I think being you is the most important part, whatever that means, right? Just be your most authentic self. It's a hard thing to do. Um, it's a hard thing in our industry. It's a hard thing in, in you know, super competitive environments like here in San Francisco. Similar, Seattle is very similar in that regard. I, I have found people get the most reward and have the most success when they're actually themselves, whatever that means. And I also think being the authentic you will not just make you better, it'll actually make whatever team you're on better, it will make whatever company you're at better, it will make whatever product or service you're working on better. Just be you. And be, be proud to be you, right? I love that. Yeah. So um, I would say do what you're passionate about because when you're passionate, you bring your best. Uh, do not be afraid to take risk. And I know this sounds like a cliche, but really, you know, challenge yourself if, um, if there is a risk, if, if you want to do something and it looks very risky, just go ahead and do it. Maximum, you're going to fail, but you'll learn something from it. And if you come out victorious, that's great. And then the last thing I would say is um, just trust yourself and, and you know, just believe in your instinct that you're doing good for the business, you're doing good for the company, you're also doing good for the, for the startups or customers or whoever <laughs> your stakeholders are and just go chase it. And if you, keep, if you keep it straight, and if you keep what I call the compass straight, um, there's gonna be a lot of amazing learning in the process. My advice is actually a great segue into our mingling and happy hour section. Mine would be to talk to as many people as you can in this industry. If you have the opportunity to get coffee with someone you really idolize or, or a mentor or someone who's doing what you wanna be doing in this industry, Having conversations, I think, is is so wonderful, and you are all about to use that LinkedIn feature that I just taught you, and and meet some really amazing people. So make connections and network, and and yeah, the, the, have the most amazing time. I want to thank both of our panelists today. A round of oh, applause. Thank for you Shlo for hosting. Charlotte. Of course. Thank you to Kitty. Thank you to Priyanka. Thank you to everyone. To Caitlin, who's not here, but oh my gosh, that amazing, amazing musical performance we had to start off the evening. And please enjoy yourselves. Have uh, I think we still have some beverages and snacks here, so have a have a wonderful time. Make sure you get some swag and stickers, and we will be around to chat. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>